Okay, here we are, Genesis uh, chapter 20, uh, not chapter actually, but uh, lesson number 24, and um, it's Genesis chapter eight. If you have your Bibles, please open those to Genesis chapter eight. Well, we've been studying the passages uh, dealing with the, um, with the great flood, the ark, Noah himself, you know, we've had a kind of a close up looking at what's going on, the preparations, uh, for that, the meaning of it, uh, the balance uh, or the parallels, if you wish, between the ark and, uh, and the church. We've commented on the great uh, similarity, as I said, that, the, uh, that this event has with the, uh, with the end of the world and the church. For example, the ark is like the church in many ways. And, and the flood is like the final judgment in many ways. One is a preview uh, of the other. Of course, there are some differences. Uh, the parallel doesn't work perfectly. Uh, for example, they didn't enter the ark before the final day, before the flood. Uh, but as far as the church is concerned, we are free to enter the church at any time. Another difference is that the flood destroyed the world uh, and a few were saved to begin again in this world. Uh, in the future, at the end of time, uh, intense heat will destroy the world and all of creation and we will not re-inhabit the old creation but rather a new heaven and a new earth suitable for spiritual bodies that will be provided us at the resurrection. So there are some differences uh, as we've noted. Okay, so last time uh, we also reviewed the flood itself, you know, the, the actual physical flood, what took place. Uh, the water for it came from the disruption of underground rivers and the envelope of water vapor that surrounded the earth. In other words, in order to have a flood, you've got to have water. So where did the water come from? Uh, as I mentioned last time, um, before the flood, okay, uh, the, the earth was irrigated by underground uh, water uh, systems and those uh, systems burst through the crust of the earth, you know, flooding it in that way. And also uh, there was a water canopy that was around the earth between the, the sky, you know, the earth, the sky, and then there was a, a water uh, canopy, a vapor canopy that served as a screen, if you wish, to maintain the balance of the weather and so on and so forth, this water vapor was also dissolved and came down uh, as rain. So we, we, we explained some of the reasons, uh, you know, where the, the water came from to create the flood. And also we, um, you know, we looked at the idea that the destruction was worldwide and total. Uh, and the destruction uh, and the upheaval you know, in the creation that uh, was caused by the flood uh, explains much of the environmental phenomena that we experience today. We have hurricanes and tidal waves and we have, uh, uh, we have um, uh, uh, earthquakes and you know, all these types of uh, um, serious, uh, phenomenal, fantastic uh, weather-related um, events uh, stem from this original source, the worldwide flood. All right, so today, Excuse me, we're going to look at the results of the flood as the waters receded and the people inside the ark began to realize the effects of the flood on the earth. And so we go to Genesis chapter 8, we start reading there. First two verses says, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused the wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. Also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed and the rain from the sky was restrained. So it's not that God had forgotten them, but that He was about to act on their behalf once again. He remembered them. He's going to act once again on their behalf. So He stopped the flood by doing three things. One, He caused the great wind to provide evaporation and the drying of the earth. Secondly, he stopped the fountains of the deep from gushing forth. Remember that oil well in the Gulf of Mexico? They'd show pictures of the, of the oil just gushing from underneath the, uh, uh, underneath, uh, the water. And uh, it was amazing. You know, they, were, they were counting the, the, the millions of gallons of, of oil that was escaping from below 
the, uh, the bottom of the sea. And it was an amazing thing to watch, wasn't it? You just see, when are they going to cap that thing? Well, this is what happened. The, from the fountains of the deep, the waters that were underneath the crust of the earth, God capped it, stopped that, that fountain you know, from flowing and, and, and creating more, um, uh, more flooding. Uh, and also he closed the windows of heaven, stopped the rain. In verse three we read, and the water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of 150 days the water decreased. So the waters receded in such a way that new land formations were created. Some folks speculate, for example, that the underground caverns produced by the release of water pressure created new basins for lakes and rivers and seas. Uh, the lessening of water pressure from below and increased weight from above caused land shifting and new land formation. You know, mountains, continents were forming. This explains the movement of the earth that scientists you know, uh, tell us about. Great land masses that were shifted around, mountains that were formed, and so on and so forth. In verse four it says, in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. So the ark, having no rudder, came to rest in a specific area in the mountains of Ararat, probably one of the highest points. Again, the specific date is given in, in the way that they kept time uh, at that period in history. We keep reading verse five, it says, the water decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Then it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent out a raven and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, so she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. So he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So no one knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. And so in this section, the rain and the flooding have stopped and they're waiting for the earth to be, a bit of, uh, to, you know, to be able to live on the earth uh, once again. Uh, they were in the ark a total of 371 days. It took roughly seven months for the earth to dry out and Noah sent birds out to test for dry land. Uh, a dove was sent and returned, nowhere to, to land, obviously. Secondly, a raven, and the significance of that is that a raven is a kind of a scavenger bird. Uh, that bird did not return. And then the dove was sent out a second time, returned this time with an olive branch or a seedling uh, or a leaf to denote that greenery was beginning to sprout once again. And so this kind of signaled that the land um, could be lived in once again. Verse 13, it says, Now it came about in the six hundredth and first, first year, in the first month, on the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. So uh, here the writer is summarizing the final days that Noah was in the ark, being very cautious, you notice, about disembarking, making absolutely sure that the earth was dry and habitable uh, you know, uh, once again. Uh, Dr. Henry Morris, I mentioned him before, use uh, his book, The Genesis Record, uh, for a lot of the material in this, uh, in this series. Dr. Henry Morris, who's a professor actually of civil engineering, he's done a lot of research in the area of scientific creationism, he lists several physical changes that would have been the result of a worldwide flood. In other words, 
if there was a worldwide flood, well, you know, how would that have changed uh, the earth? And he lists several of them. First of all, the oceans would be more extensive since they now contain the residue of water from below and from above the earth. Secondly, much less land is um, uh, able to be lived upon, uh, able to be productive, having either been destroyed or covered with, with water. Thirdly, the thermal vapor blanket was dissolved, causing the earth to be subject to extreme temperatures, thus creating the tropical and the Arctic climates, as well as greater violent weather, and I mentioned this before. You know, the weather in the pre-Diluvian, the pre-flood time, the weather was much different than it is today, and much of the weather phenomenon that takes place in our day is due to the um, uh, consequences, if you wish, uh, or the effects caused by the uh, great uh, flood. Um, also, mountain ranges were produced, uh, making much of the land uninhabitable. Right? Mountains are beautiful, but you, know, I mean, you look at the Rocky Mountains, maybe you ski on some of them, but they're, they're not, you're not able to live uh, in those places. Also, the Earth's crust, now having greater movement, became uh, because of the emptying of the subterranean water reservoirs. So you know, if there was water there holding everything up, but you cause a, a hollowing out of beneath the crust of the Earth, things move, and we know that here in Oklahoma, don't we? Uh, the, uh, you know, we're having earthquakes, you know, and a lot of it is, uh, scientists think, uh, caused by the drilling, by the emptying out of fluid from under the earth, causing the earth to, causing the earth to move. Another um, result, the fossil records are produced as all forms of life are buried in the sediment of the flood. Uh, and these are scattered everywhere and are misread as evolution, evolutionary models instead of records of death caused by the flood. You know, that's why they find fossils of animals you know, and, and, and trees and leaves everywhere on the earth. And in the sediment, in the layers of sediment, they find uh, you know, uh, different types of animals at every level. They've even found you know, fully you know, preserved uh, uh, mammoths, you know, uh, elephants and uh, large beasts, you know, fully, fully formed in, in sediment, frozen in time. Why, how did that happen? Surely not with the slow moving million year ice age. No, something catastrophic that happened all of a sudden in, in the space of days that overtook you know, such, such a large, you know, an elephant, you know what I'm saying? So what could cause this type of phenomenon? Well, the answer that we offer is the worldwide flood. A sudden, dramatic, cataclysmic event you know, that covered the entire earth. And the evidence of it is seen everywhere on earth, not just in one, not just in one place. So let's look at the relationship you know, between God and Noah after the flood. Uh, we continue in verse 15. It says, Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons, and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth, and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. So just as God had, uh, had invited Noah into the ark, now He commands Noah and his family to leave the ark and go forth to repopulate and subdue the land once again. Now there's a parallel here. Remember we talked about the parallel things between the, uh, between the ark and the church, between the flood and the, the judgment. Um, the parallel here is that Jesus invites us into the church and once we enter in, He sends us forth to go and make disciples of all nations in order to multiply. So just as God you know, invited Noah into the ark to be saved and then after the disastrous flood, He 
you know, sent him forward to go back and to repopulate and resettle the land. The parallel is Jesus invites us into the church and then sends us forth from the church to go and multiply by uh, preaching uh, the gospel. And so the Bible confirms that all humans and animals find their original ancestors from these people on the ark and these animals. Uh, Andrew Woods, uh, in his book, The Center of the Earth, shows that the earth's land area center is just a short distance from Mount Ararat. You know, this kind of information doesn't make it you know, to, into USA Today or into the popular uh, radio or television uh, programs because they are uh, completely uh, locked into the idea of evolution. But there's plenty of literature and plenty of writing by very intelligent uh, and scientific minds uh, that support the idea of uh, or the teaching of uh, creation. So um, the Bible says that the animals begin to multiply, diversity within their types, they find places where the climate and the food and the geography suited their particular, their particular needs. Now, as the weather changed, because now the weather is going to change because of the flood, uh, it changes from a kind of a greenhouse, you know, completely controlled, to either a tropical or arctic type of weather. Uh, we find that some animals were able to survive and others did not. Uh, the dinosaur, the uh, Pteranodonus, uh, the Creodos, uh, uh, other strange pre-Diluvian beasts you know, could not adapt and became extinct. Some people say, well, what happened? Were there dinosaurs on the ark? Yeah, it says animals, two by two. The point I'm making here is that after the flood and after the animals left the ark, because of the change of weather, the extreme change of weather, some were able to adapt and others uh, were not and became extinct. You know, scientists like to say, but cannot prove, this idea of everything happening over millions and millions of years. Uh, we know that uh, these animals could have become extinct just as easily in a few centuries because they couldn't adapt to the new, uh, to the new weather patterns. In verse 20, we continue, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Interesting verse here. Uh, this is the first mention of altar. You know, built an altar in the Bible. And so Noah offers sacrifices of thanks. Note that he gives one-seventh of his wealth. Uh, the clean animals were for food and clothing, and they were important for survival, and Noah had seven pairs to begin to replenish the supply, but he offers you know, in sacrifice 15, roughly 15%, one-seventh, okay, as a sacrifice. Verse 21 and 22, to finish out this chapter, it says, the Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And so God responds to Noah's prayer by promising two things. So Noah gets off the, 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 the ark, first thing he does, he builds an offer, he, an altar rather, offers sacrifices, his way, uh, the, the way of that time to, um, to offer thanksgiving and praise to make requests. And here the writer tells us that God answers Noah's prayers by promising two things. First, um, he would not curse or condemn the earth as he had done with the flood ever again. And so he establishes that man's nature is now sinful. It's not a condemnation here. It's, he's, he's simply expressing a fact. Man is sinful. He will always be sinful. That, that's part of his nature. Uh, of course, this doesn't justify the sins that man does, but it reassures Noah that he permits man to live even though he is sinful. 
It's as if God is saying to Noah, you know what, I know that you are weak. I know that your flesh is weak. I know that you know, no matter how hard you try, you're, you're always going to be sinful. And so Noah knows that God destroyed man because of sin. And so he needs reassurance that as sin appears in man, including himself, God will not destroy the world again because of that sin. Now we know that God has another plan, don't we? We know that there's the seed of promise. Remember that, that line of thought that runs all the way through the Bible that began in Genesis? We know that there's a, there's a plan that God has to take care of and to deal with man's sinfulness. Here he's simply reassuring Noah, I know you're a sinner, I understand that, and I will not you know, judge the world, I won't destroy the world because of this reality and this truth. And then the second uh, promise that he makes is that the new environment will be able to sustain man. Remember now, they're coming from this perfect greenhouse you know, environment that they lived in and now it's a whole new world after the flood. Now there are floods and there are hurricanes and there's rain and there's heat and so on, you know, extreme weather that they didn't experience before. So Noah knew the old world and its environment, but now he faces devastation and an uncertain future. And so God promises him that there will be a cycle of harvesting and there will be, uh, 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 that the new environment rather will be cyclical so as to not despair when the violent weather comes. Also, there's a promise for future generations that the environment and the earth will always be capable of sustaining mankind. Now, I'm not saying that there are not problems you know, in our, quote, environment. Uh, we see storms and devastation all the time, don't we? The promise is that the, 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 uh, the climate will be cyclical. The promise is that God will make sure that the earth is able to sustain mankind despite this devastation of the climate, this devastation of the earth caused by the flood. You know, I've said before that a lot of times, you know, the starvation and the droughts and things like that that go on, many times caused by human beings, by greed, you know, over, you know, over farming one area or you know, cutting down too many trees and so on and so forth by bad management of the land or just greed, simple, simple greed. Because the earth is still able to feed everybody. This was an original promise that God made. And also that you know, he wasn't going to curse the environment, uh, he wasn't going to curse the earth because of sin. Imagine every time it started to rain, everybody kind of feel a little shaky, right? Whoa, it's starting to rain. I wonder if we're going to get another 40 days and 40 nights, right? So God said, don't worry about that. I will, I will take care of that. All right, so now we, um, we look at the establishment of human, um, of human government uh, in chapter nine. So chapter nine begins the description of the covenant that God makes with Noah and includes instructions for human social government, which until this time had not existed. It was very tribal, all right? So chapter nine, verse one and two, it says, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand, they are given. So God once again gives man a charge to multiply and replenish the earth. Now, this time, uh, unlike Adam and Eve, this time man does not have dominion over the earth as he once did because there was perfect harmony between man and the environment. Now, man and the environment, uh, uh, or rather the environment, has been you know, destroyed. A, ter a terrible cataclysm has taken place because of sin and then the result of sin, you know, God's judgment in the flood. So instead, you know, man's no longer going to have dominion. Instead, God puts the fear of man into the animals so that they will not totally overrun and destroy mankind. A lot more animals out there than human beings at this time. Man is also given the right to use the environment for his purposes you know, in good stewardship. 
He's allowed to you know, eat the vegetables, he's allowed to eat the meat, and so on and so forth. We'll see that in a moment. Well, uh, when, when God is giving him this, uh, this, uh, this uh, privilege. Uh, in verse three, let's keep reading, it says, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. See, that's the passage I was looking at. I give all to you as I gave the green plant, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, it's blood. So God authorizes for the first time the eating of meat. Now we know that this may have been done before, but it wasn't with God's permission. Perhaps the weather now requires more protein and so on and so forth. You know? Perhaps as a way of population control for the animals. Uh, whatever all the reasons are, um, uh, uh, God authorizes the eating of meat at this time. Um, but God does not permit the eating of the blood. First of all, physically dangerous, we know that to a certain extent, and theologically, the blood represents life, and life is what is offered to God in sacrifice. And so it was, you know, blood was to, the, the purpose of the blood, you know, theologically, was to offer sacrifice to God, not to be eaten you know, as, as, um, as food. And also, uh, to avoid pagan, the pagan practice of drinking the blood to gain the powers and the character of the victim, whether it be an animal or a human. That still goes on today in certain primitive religions around the world. You know, the eating, the cannibalization of human beings, the drinking of blood of, a, of certain animals gave you that animal's power, that animal's speed, so on and so forth. And so God prohibits the eating, the drinking of blood foreseeing this, um, this eventuality. In verse five it says, surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. So here God establishes the concept that life, as represented by the blood of animals and man, belongs to God and He will judge those who spill blood or who, who murder. Spilling blood, murder is the same, the same idea here. Even animals are under God's judgment if they kill a person. Now in the future the Mosaic law specified that the animal itself, you know, if a bull or an animal killed an individual, that animal had to be killed. And humans who kill other humans also must pay with their lives. So uh, this is where we get into you know, capital punishment, so on and so forth. The, this is one of the verses used in the Old Testament to demonstrate what the Bible says about that. So in verse six, God is quite specific in two ways. One, the price for murder will be the forfeiture of one's own life. If you take a life, you know, if you murder someone, you forfeit your own life uh, in order to um, in order to um, um, uh, fulfill uh, God's uh, justice. And then the second thing is the responsibility to carry out this justice is now given to man. Okay? So until this time, there was no government, you know, no police, that type of thing. Each man rendered justice in his own way according to conscience and ability. As men became more sinful, this entire society fell into evil and violence. That's the reason why God warned man you know, that, the just, that the judgment of the flood was coming. You know, the intent, every intent of his heart was evil. And that included violence and so on and so forth. So God now sets the large perimeter, if you wish, around social justice. A life for a life, and God authorizes man to do it without fear of revenge. That's the key here. If God authorizes execution, uh, then there is no revenge on the properly appointed executioner, thus ending the cycle of revenge. You see the problem here. Somebody kills your brother, and then you take, you know, you take justice into your own hands, and you kill that person. And then that person's brother, because you killed him, feels obliged now to take you know, revenge uh, for his brother's death and he's going to try to kill you and if he kills you and then your cousin is going to go after, you know, it's like a cycle, it never ends. So if man has the right 
given to him by God to execute capital punishment, he also has the right and responsibility to develop laws that will help prevent and discourage the type of things that lead to this ultimate crime, whether they be robbery or rape or, or kidnapping, so on and so forth. So the cycle of revenge is broken. Someone kills someone, someone murders someone, the people, society, the government appoints someone to execute justice on the murderer. So it's no longer revenge, it's justice. And because it's justice authorized by God, it breaks the cycle of revenge. All right, so some final thoughts about capital punishment and the Bible, a couple of things we need to think about when we think about this debate. It's a very hot debate even to this day, right? So here's some things to think about. First of all, both the Old Testament and the New Testament support the idea that the government has a right to execute murderers. We read about this in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6 in the Old Testament, and in Romans chapter 13, uh, beginning in um, verse 1. Let's read that. That's a very interesting uh, passage. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. Uh, this is Paul writing. He says, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So Paul is saying, you know, government authority is established by God and God gives to that authority the right to punish criminal and bearing the sword, the sword is the sword of justice, the sword of capital uh, punishment. Um, the, um, the idea here, of course, is that God authorizes uh, uh, capital punishment both in the Old and in the, um, and in the New Testament um, in the New Testament as well. Some people say, well, what if it's an unjust government and so on and so forth? Remember, you know, God authorizes authority. God authorizes government. But anything that God authorizes, God also judges. So whoever is you know, responsible, whoever is uh, in a position of authority, uh, uh, you know, established by God, that person will be judged for what they do, uh, for what they do as well. It's interesting to note also that in Exodus uh, chapter 23, let's find that particular verse, shall we? Exodus 23, go, keep, your, keep your finger in uh, uh, you know, Genesis, but go to Exodus chapter 23. A very interesting passage here. In Exodus 23 verse seven it says, um, keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent or the righteous, for I will not acquit the guilty. So there, what you have there is a warning by God to those who are in authority, to government, to be very careful how they uh, carry out justice, especially capital punishment type justice. Because he says, if you execute the innocent, if you don't, you know, if you don't properly uh, uh, carry out justice, you will be judged for that. So all of this to say that both the Old and the New Testament both authorized the government to um, carry out uh, justice in executing criminals guilty of uh, capital, uh, capital crimes, and at the same time, God warns the government that they have to do this judiciously and carefully because God will judge them in how they carried out this justice. All right, another idea. Both the Old Testament and New Testament support the idea that God loves and encourages mercy towards murderers. You know, David, the second king of Israel, right? David, the psalmist, 
He was a murderer, wasn't he? I mean, he killed a lot of people in battle, but he was also a murderer because when he seduced, seduced Bathsheba and, and um, uh, excuse me, when he seduced the wife of Uriah uh, and got her pregnant and then tried to cover it over by having him killed, I mean, that, that, was, that was premeditated murder. So he was a murderer. And Paul the Apostle, wasn't he guilty of murder? Certainly by association. He voted and encouraged and you know, stood by while they, they actually uh, executed an innocent man, Stephen. And we don't know all the, the things that he did when he was uh, persecuting Christians, putting them in jail and punishing them and, and torturing them and so on and so forth. Who knows if some of them, uh, if some of them died. But God, you know, these two men, did they not find mercy in God's eyes? David found mercy. Paul found mercy. So we have to have a kind of a, you know, a balanced and biblical view of this question. And so a balanced and biblical view of the question of uh, capital punishment uh, could be the following. The government retains the right given to it by God to either exercise the death penalty or show mercy. And these things depend on the crime, the repentance, and the circumstances of each case. The, the problem that we have uh, in this debate is both sides want all or nothing. One side wants the death penalty all the time, you know, no restrictions, and then the other side wants no death penalty under any circumstances. And, and, and either side, you know, and, and both sides claim the Bible you know, as the proof text. The Bible says, you know, have mercy. You know, the Bible says, you know, God gives the government the right to exercise capital punishment. Well, they're both right. The Bible gives each side you know, their argument. And so a combination of the two is usually a much more biblical uh, a much more biblical response to this problem. Yes, the government has the right to execute uh, capital punishment on criminals guilty of capital crimes. But yes, the government also has the right to show mercy to these same individuals, depending on the case and the circumstances and, and so on and so forth, because every, everyone, is, everyone is different. All right, so a little, um, hopefully a little study, a little discussion about uh, one of the more uh, controversial issues uh, that uh, people have, capital punishment, uh, and go to the Bible to find their defense. Okay, well that's our lesson for now. That's lesson 24. We're going to push ahead uh, next time uh, and we continue in Genesis, uh, the recovery from the, uh, from the Great Flood. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.